Thank you to everybody for taking time out of your afternoon to learn about these future transit services that we're planning between San Isidro and Sorrento Mesa and being willing to give us your input. Um, just wanted to go over the plan for today. You're going to hear a little bit of background about these projects, why we're working on them, um, a bit of an overview of the difference between the two different projects being planned and some timelines for those. Um, and then after that, uh, we just want to hear your feedback. Um, and at the very end, there's going to be an opportunity for um, some longer questions um, and answers. So um, if you have a question while we're presenting, don't feel like you have to wait till the end. You can go ahead and drop that question either in the Q&A um, or in the chat box if it's a quick question or if it's urgent, like you didn't understand something, there's a technical difficulty we're not aware of, please let us know. Um, and um, you can find those options at the bottom of your screen. Um, yeah, so for anybody who hasn't connected with us before, we just wanted to introduce uh, who is SANDAG. Um, so we are the regional transportation planning agency that works for you. So you pay taxes, um, the federal and state government send some of that money back to the region through us to plan our transportation system, that's um, our roads, highways, bike lanes, anything that helps people move around the region. So that could be small things like planning a new bus route to huge projects like the new border crossing that's in process uh, in East Otay Mesa. Um, and then we also from there build transportation projects of all sizes. Um, so that could be quicker things like when we added bike lanes to El Cajon Boulevard, or um, sometimes major construction, like when we added 11 new miles to the Blue Line trolley to UC San Diego. Um, and while we do all of that work, uh, we also work on preserving natural resources in the region to make sure our work is supporting a safe and healthy environment. And um, at the same time, we're also providing resources um, that are related to people getting around the region easier. Um, things like our free youth transit pass program um, that's been operating for a couple of years now. Um, we give funding to local cities to fix potholes, um, funding to accelerate housing development and a whole lot more. So those are um, the types of things that we're working on. And um, just to introduce myself, um, my name is Alejandra Fenn. Um, you can call me Ali. I work in public outreach and here with me today presenting are two of our senior regional planners, Cecily Taylor and Brian Lane, and they're gonna be presenting later in the presentation. Um, so now that you guys know who we are, um, I, I wish we could uh, get to know all of you, but since um, we have a ton of people on the call today, we just thought we'd start with a poll so we can get a sense of who's here. So um, if we could launch our first poll question, we just want to know what's your connection to the area on the map? Do we live there? We work there? We got a business? Go to school? Cool, and I see everybody participating. I'll just give it another couple seconds to give everyone a chance to do it. Okay, awesome. Great. So, um, yeah, so it looks like we have a good mix of um, people who live in the study area, people who work there. We've got um, people who come to the area for shopping or entertainment or go to recreational areas, a little bit of everything. Awesome. Um, and our next question, if we could launch it, what places do you visit most in the area? Good, and I'm seeing some responses coming in. It's looking like a lot of people are visiting the UTC area. A lot of people saying Kearney Mesa, SDSU, City Heights, 
Chula Vista. Look, looks like we got a good mix of people from all over. Awesome. We still have a couple of responses trickling in. Awesome. And um, if you responded other to um, either of these first two questions, feel free to drop those answers into the chat um, to let us know as well. Cool. So I think we can show everybody the results of that. Great. Um, well, it's good to just get a sense of who's on the call. It looks like we have a good mix of people who um, have a lot of different connections to the area um, and a good mix of people um, that are um, located um, and, and visiting um, a bunch of places in this area as well. So thanks for that. Um, so with that, I'm going to turn things over to my coworker, Brian, who's going to tell you more background about these projects. Great. Thanks, Allie. And welcome, everybody. Glad we got a huge uh, amount of people here to listen about these services. So why are we planning more transit service between San Ysidro and Cerno Mesa? For a long time, community organizations have been advocating for a new transit line more inland than the Blue Line, going from South County to Central San Diego. From the outreach we've done in the past, we learned that people wanted a new transit line that they named the Purple Line to connect to jobs and other transit routes and that people wanted stops located as much as possible in the heart of communities so that they were easy to get to from where people live and where they need to go. And just in general, we've heard that transit in the region should be faster and more frequent. So if you're on this call, you probably already know why this route is so critical. The data we have about how people are moving north to south on this route supports what the public has been asking for. The I-5 and the 805 freeways have some of the worst traffic backups in the region during peak hours. While the Blue Line trolley is an option for people along the coast, right now there isn't really any direct transit to serve north-south trips more inland through the central part of the region. And why are the freeways so crowded? Because we have some major concentrations of jobs here in University City, Cerro Mesa, and in Kearney Mesa, and a lot of people living in City Heights, Southeast San Diego, and South County. Here's just one example of data about where people are commuting to, where we see um, where the South County residents are going throughout the region. There's a good number that work in South County and in downtown San Diego, but a lot of people are going further north to Kearney Mesa and UTC University City and Cerno Mesa and Cerno Valley. A new transit line would give people an attractive option besides making this trip driving. So now we'd like to hear from you again. If we can launch the, our third poll, how do you get to the places in the study area now? We'll give you a minute or so. You guys have been great answering the questions really fast. I'm already seeing a lot of answers. Oh no, I see a lot of drive alone and I get it because right now there's not good options, right? Some folks do take transit, some using ride share, a few folks using bike and walking. That's great, but again, drive alone is still the number one mode for most people in this area. I think the responses are slowing down. And did we share those? Perfect. So as you can see, driving alone is the one of the most common uh, ways people are getting up and down. But some people are taking transit and some are biking and walking. All right. Our fourth poll question for the night is, how often do you use public transit? We got a mix of those who rely on it to get most places, but it seems like most people are using it a few times a month, a few times a year. 17% right now are two to three times a week, 12% every day of the week. And of course, a few of you um, that don't take transit. Never. All right. Looks like it's slowing down. I'll show the results of that. And for those of you who did say other, could you explain that in the chat? We appreciate it. All right, great. Thank you all for that. 
So with that in mind, we're planning two projects between neighborhoods connected by the I-805, a rapid bus and what we call the Purple Line. These new transit lines will connect San Ysidro to Serrano Mesa through National City, City Heights, and Kearney Mesa, and will expand access to jobs, schools, medical services, recreation, and more. These faster transit services will offer an attractive option besides driving. And with few people driving, with fewer people driving, our region will reduce greenhouse gas emissions, fight climate change, and have cleaner air to breathe. Starting today through next year, we're reaching out to the community to help narrow down where these routes could go. The lines shown here are just us connecting dots between the neighborhoods or following existing roadways that seem reasonable, but more analysis, planning, public input will help us identify where exactly the rapid bus and Purple Line will actually go. Keep in mind, these aren't the only new transit routes coming in these areas. There are other rapid routes we're planning, um, east-west routes, um, other ones going to downtown, various other areas. But you know, we are we want you to stay in touch with us to hear updates about other new transit routes and how we're improving existing services. So, how are these two projects different? So we've heard how we urgently people need direct transit service in these neighborhoods. They can't wait 20 years. So in the short term, that would be this rapid bus route 688. Rapid buses are way faster to get up and running than a rail line like the Purple Line could be. For this bus route, we're trying to strike a balance between speeding up trip times on the freeway while also getting people directly to where they need to go. We'll look into various options for the route, including potentially offering different versions of this route. It might not be that every 688 trip serves all stops or that it takes alternative streets on some trips. For example, the current Rapid Express bus routes 280 and 290, which currently take commuters between North County and downtown, it has slightly different paths and serves different stops. But the longer term transit option we're planning is the Purple Line, which could eventually be a high-speed transit line that links to all of our existing trolley lines, as well as many existing and planned rapid bus routes. Last year, we started meeting with city staff and transit operators along this route and analyzing what it would take to build the Purple Line as a subway-like transit line. This study is giving us some ideas about where the rail could go and how it could be built, and we have a lot more work to do, to do before any final decisions are made. And with that, I'm going to hand it over to Cecily. Thanks, Brian. So I wanted to speak a bit more to what we mean when we say long term for the Purple Line. Here we're showing some similar rail projects and how long they took to get built and start operating. Keep in mind, the Purple Line would be 31 miles long and possibly include tunneling. So all of that takes a while too. So for instance, if we look at the top example here of a train they built in Seattle, that's about half as long as the Purple Line. And that took 21 years from the start of planning to beginning to run trains. And they didn't have to tunnel underground very much. So hopefully this gives you a sense of the long road we know we have ahead of us. The good news is, as Brian said, a bus can get up and running a lot faster. On the next slide, we'll show the steps that are needed to make either a bus or a rail project a reality. Both projects really have the same process, but a rail project is a lot more complicated, so each step takes longer. Right now, we're doing some early planning for both projects, and after that, we'll analyze more specific details and continue getting public feedback to figure out where exactly these routes will go, where stops will be, and how we can accomplish the project. For the Purple Line, this means figuring out the type of transit it would be, it could be a subway or an above ground train, a trolley, and so on. And there's a lot of other details like what maintenance facilities would be needed, making sure the project minimizes how much it impacts the environment and the nearby communities, and a whole lot more. Then, once we have a final plan for the project that we know will work best, we have to apply for and be successful at getting funding a few different times in this process but then we can do the project's final design and construction. Now the rapid bus won't take quite as long, but it still has its own details to work out, like the design of the bus stops, how the bus will get around traffic if needed and other pieces like that. Over the next couple of years, we'll be reaching out to keep getting input from the community about these projects at every step of the way. Today, we're hearing from all of you through the polls we're doing, and we're also kicking off an online survey today with the same questions so we can hear from as many people as possible. So we've already gotten some input from you, uh, but now we wanna ask a 
bit more about the kinds of places in these areas that get visited by a lot of people uh, a lot of times during the week. So we've done some research and found a bunch of these locations, as you can see on the map, but please let us know what we're missing. Uh, for now, don't worry about the numbers that are on the labels on the map. We just went from north to south for all the destinations, and we're going to go through the whole route from south to north in chunks here, so we can really zoom in. So here, starting with San Isidro and Chula Vista, we've highlighted some places like Third Avenue area, some schools and hospitals, the locations where you can cross the border on foot, and the shopping and community centers. So let us know in the poll, are there any other major places that many people go to? And what we have in mind are places along the lines of places with a lot of jobs, medical centers, big schools, shopping centers, and so on. Looks like we're getting some responses. I'll, I'll uh, pause here and let people continue answering. Yeah, I know it'll take a second for people to look at the map and see where stuff is located. Or like, what's that place called? People Google Maps and some stuff real quick. So we'll let them do that. Cool, are we seeing any more responses rolling in or should we start reading off what people are saying? And um, if you need to do your homework and come back to this, um, just remember uh, you can go ahead and submit the same information in a survey we're gonna share with you after this call. So don't worry about that. And let me um, just pull up the details of what folks are saying. Did you guys lose my, um, my presentation or are you still viewing it? Uh, it looks like we're seeing your web browser now. Yeah, all right, good. Because you guys are seeing my second screen. Okay, cool. So it looks like um, some folks had mentioned um, Southwestern College. Um, looks like some other folks mentioned um, just to stop in something in Otay Mesa connections, um, the Chula Vista Civic Center. Um, some folks um, were wondering about connections to the Cross Border Express, um, which I think if we could put a question about that in the Q&A um, regarding transit service to the CBX, I think Brian could speak to that at the end. Um, some folks mentioned the Palm Avenue Mall. Great. Awesome. And we're going to, um, if you want to see what everybody had responded to this later, um, I think we'll be adding these to the map that's going to be on the survey so you can view all those online as well. Um, if we wanted to move on to the next area, Cecily. Sure, thanks, Sally. So here we're moving a bit farther north to National City and Canto, southeastern San Diego. And we, in our research, we found more schools, some parks and shopping, but we'll launch the poll and you can let us know if there's anything else we missed in this area. There it goes. Give you time to respond. Still seeing some responses rolling in. So I'm just gonna give it another 
another 20 seconds or so as people are typing stuff in. Great, I think we could um, wrap that up in just a second. And if you didn't get yours in, don't you worry, you can definitely submit it online as well after the call. If I can just check out our results. Sorry, it keeps toggling back and forth. Um, some folks mentioned the National City Food Hall off of eight. Um, some folks mentioned um, the cemetery, the Southcrest Rec Center, Morse High School, um, the businesses on Highland Avenue. Yeah, plenty of places to eat over there that folks are traveling to. And the um, some folks asking about connections to the City College Educational Complex. Cool. Thanks for that, y'all. All right, next uh, showing Mid City and Mission Valley here. Um, we noted some other schools and shopping centers, and we included the new Snapdragon Stadium and the new site that SDSU is developing. But let us know if there's anything else uh, that we should make sure to note for this section. Cool, still seeing some results coming in. We'll wait just a hair longer. Some people are typing with thumbs. Great, and thanks to those um, that are waiting, listening to areas that maybe you're not as familiar with um, so folks can get in their responses. Okay, I think we can go ahead and call that here, but please feel free to share any more that we missed um, after the call as well. And I'm seeing um, some folks who mentioned um, the City Heights YMCA, let's see, the Mission, Trails Regional Park, um, some folks who mentioned the Montgomery Airfield, um, and connections to the Green Line. Some folks were concerned about that. Great. Thank you. All right. And now, finally, at the north, we have Kearney Mesa, Sereno Mesa, and UTC. Here's definitely more schools, including a part of UCSD and the medical center that's there on campus, shopping, and we pointed out also the Convoy District and Qualcomm being a major regional employer. But in the last poll here, let us know if there's anything we missed.
Great. Thanks for answering everyone. Still seeing responses coming in. And there's a lot going on in this area. A lot of these areas too. And just a reminder, I think we saw some hands going up. Feel free to drop questions into the Q&A, but if you're having trouble typing, you can go ahead and keep those virtual hands up and we could always call on people verbally if you're having trouble typing in the Q&A. Cool. Um, I think we can call it on this one. Um, and let's see what destinations people were talking about. People mentioned um, the Executive Drive Office Park, courthouses in Kearney Mesa. People were wondering about trolley connections to the coaster, Miramar College. Um, good, some people reiterating um, what we said about the convoy district um, and uh, talked about the medical center um, that's nearby for older folks. Um, some people uh, mentioning how um, Kearney Mesa is gonna get a lot more housing in the future um, and might need two stations. Um, yeah, and a lot more feedback as well. What other things people say? People, uh, major medical areas um, and the VA. Cool, great, so lots of, um, different results that people had mentioned. Amazing. Yeah, with that, thank you so much, everyone, for sharing your feedback through the polls. And now we can answer some questions before wrapping up with that survey link that was promised and some last steps. Yeah, so I'm just going to um, go ahead and pull up some of these questions that folks had so we can answer them live. Um, I saw that, let's see. So um, we're just gonna start um, with a couple of frequently asked questions that we've been getting um, in our Purple Line email. Um, the first question that we've seen a lot is, is the Purple Line gonna go underground? Cecily, can you speak to that? Yes, absolutely. So uh, still a lot of planning to be done. As Brian mentioned, we are considering at this point, both above ground and underground. Um, it's really still early to tell which one will be best, um, but it's something we'll continue to study and get feedback from the public before making any final decisions. Great. Um, and um, another question, that we've seen is, are there any plans to add other transit routes that connect with Eastern Chula Vista and Otay Mesa? Brian, could you tell people about that? Yeah, hundred percent. There's, um, we have some ideas for routes that go all the way across Palomar, um, routes that go across, um, I believe it's Main Street, um, across another one, um, across our, I'm playing with my map, H Street, that would go over into Otai. And I think there's another question about, you know, connecting Otai Ranch to East Lake. And there are a couple of proposed rapid routes that kind of go north, south along that area. The, the one along Main Street would come all the way from Chula Vista, West Chula Vista, into East Chula Vista, and then cut up into um, Otai Ranch. So there's a lot of great things in the, in the proposed network. Yeah, and I don't know, Brian, if um, maybe you want to drop a link to the initial concept or somewhere where people could look at maps of of those planned routes or proposed routes, because um, a lot of that's going to be solidified with our 2025 regional plan, um, which the draft is going to come out um, with a cool interactive map where you can see a lot of those routes that'll be coming out um, in the spring, probably end of April, early May. Um, 
Great. We had another question for Cecily. What uh, do we know what stops that the bus and the train are going to make? Um, we don't know yet. That's definitely part of the studying that we're that we need to do. Part of why we're asking for this input now to identify what those popular destinations are. Um, but we'll be we'll take this work. We'll do some analysis, and next year we'll come back and ask the public to help us narrow down those specific stop locations for for both of the routes. Well, thank you. Um, there was another question someone had. Um, specifically about east-west transit, because um, um, there's um, some folks in areas like Carmel Valley, Del Mar Highlands, Pacific Highlands Ranch, um, that are wondering um, if there's any transit planned in those areas. So we have looked at that as well. Um, I think in the 2025 draft concept, we have a couple express routes coming over from um, the Saber Springs kind of area across the 56 down into the UTC and or Sereno Valley area. Cool. Great. Thank you for that. And um, another question for Brian. Um, how does the Rapid 688 route overlap with the, the 235 route? Because I know the 235 is the one that goes from Chula Vista to SESU. No, 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 something else. Oh, that's 235 the... is the one that comes down the I-15. Oh, no, Indiana. right. That's just like the six something. There's, There's yeah, so many numbers. 225 is the yeah. South Bay Rapid. Yeah. And and there, there, there are some proposed overlaps. But again, kind of I was talking earlier, I think like even with the Rapid Express 280, 290 today, um, they might appear to overlap, but they're actually serving different stops at um, the north end up in um, Palo Escondido. So some for this as well. Um, like the 235 and this might overlap for a little bit, but we're really trying to get folks from South County up into um, SDSU West, City Heights, to Kearney Mesa, UTC. The 235 doesn't quite do that. So the, while there may appear to be some overlaps on the maps, there, these routes really help to serve different um, origin and destination pairs that people are doing out there. Great. Um, and Cecily, people are wondering, um, will the Purple Line and the 688 bus um, have um, park and ride parking lots that are free because existing trolley lines often have um, problems where there's not free parking available at the stops? Yeah, that's a great question and definitely something that will be studied as we get the projects farther along. We definitely want people to be able to reach the stations using variety of different modes of transportation, however they need to get to the bus or the train, uh, want to provide parking where it's appropriate. Cool. Um, and Brian, people are wondering, um, what's the plan for security um, and protecting against fare avoidance on the purple line? Um, because um, this person had mentioned how the presence of um, folks that are unhoused or people experiencing mental health issues sometimes can be an obstacle um, to people wanting to take transit aside from how fast it is and where it's located. So right now we're currently are planning to have a fare and it would be similar to what's on the trolley. Um, if, it's, if it becomes like a full subway route, maybe it could be similar to the coaster, but we are looking at ways to decrease coaster fares as well. But I think, you know, right now there is a plan to have a fare and, you know, working with MTS and or NCTD along their ways of how they currently um, patrol their systems. And, you know, they're looking to kind of go more towards um, secure, safety and security rather than fare evasion and things like that. Um, you know, when you, are, when you are focusing on safety and security, um, fare evasion is part of that, but it's really more making the riders who um, maybe don't take transit today, maybe might hear that it, it is more safe and secure and, and they might ride in the future. Great, thank you. Um, and Cecily, is there any consideration to have the purple line and the blue line connect in the UTC area to allow for this person said ridership balancing and allowing stops on each to be connected 
without having to link through the green line in Mission Valley? Yeah, definitely. Well, well, you still have to do the planning to confirm the stops that UTC transit centers already such a great hub for not just the blue line, but also a lot of bus routes. So we that's really high on our list for making sure we can get a purple line, um, whatever the whatever that looks like uh, connected there so people can make transfers. And, and it's true, maybe some folks traveling north to south that are currently on the blue line, maybe the purple line would work better for them. And we, uh, both of those can serve those connections that we saw on the commuting map. Cool. Um, and Brian, somebody had asked earlier, um, are there any plans for transit connecting people to the cross-border express? Yeah, definitely. We've, we heard a lot of that in our outreach for the 2025 regional plan. So we do have an express route um, right now penciled in between uh, CBX and the Iris Trolley Station. Um, and there are future ideas of, you know, even going further. Um, I was at a public outreach event in Vista in San Marcos and got cornered by a group of lovely old ladies who were telling me we needed to go all the way up to that area. And I'd never heard that before. And, and they were all agreeing with each other. So we, we've heard that and we, you know, right now we're penciling in something to Iris Trolley, but we'll keep looking further as well. Yeah, because I know there's people using the CBX that are, they're coming down from um, as far as LA. I know my Thea does that too. So, yeah. Okay. Um, and let's see. Um, I think um, some people had, um, I saw a question in the chat that um, some people had like multiple destinations that they were trying to submit in the poll earlier. Um, don't worry, we're gonna drop the survey link that has like a mapping tool where you can put in as many destinations as you want on the map after the call. So if for some reason you didn't get in all the destinations that you wanted to say on the poll, like definitely um, put those in uh, the survey link after this call. Um, and um, Brian, there's another uh, transit question. Is there a plan to connect Otay Ranch and East Lake given the high concentration of folks commuting to work from there? I think you'd mentioned that earlier. Yeah, yeah. But could you reiterate that for folks? Uh, yeah, there's a, a proposed rapid 265 that would um, come up from uh, Otai Mesa port of entry and actually get off and do some local streets and hit and combine those two areas. The the one along Main Street when Main Street does connect from West Chula Vista to the Otai Ranch area. Um, eventually, the city of San Diego or Chula Vista are working on that. That uh, Rapid 635 would also go up there and do that connection. Great, thank you. Um, and Cecily, somebody's wondering. Um, Will um, either of these lines be connected to future services like the coaster? Um, and is the purple line planned as a completely de-interlined route? If not, how come? And I don't know what de-interlined means, but maybe that's a fancy planning term that you know. <laughs> yeah, I think essentially like using the same tracks or uh, really close together. Um, that's definitely something that we'll need to study. Uh, as I mentioned before, we don't know yet what that type of transit purple line could be. Uh, we know that we want something that's, uh, or at least we're considering something beyond a bus, but it could look like a coaster, it could look like a trolley, or it could be something else. And um, there's a lot to consider about what those implications would be if we, if we chose a trolley uh, for a purple line, could a coaster use the same tracks or not? Uh, is there room, especially um, towards the border, is there room for all of this different rail service? So we're, we're doing these studies that we mentioned today. We're also doing other planning studies to look at the north-south transit service between the border and downtown. Um, a lot of planning going on to improve the transportation's transit network here. Great. Um, and Brian, someone's wondering, are there any plans to connect to SDSU West via a direct access ramp for the Rapid 688 and the Rapid 235? Um, 
because this person thinks it's important to connect to the green line. 100%. So we, we definitely want to get these routes on the I-15 over into um, near the stadium and to whatever SDSUS ends up building in there. So we are thinking of a direct access ramp um, off the I-15 that would get you over there. We don't want to have to go all the way up to Friars and weave back around down back in. So ideally working with Caltrans, um, if we could make that happen, that would make this route perform so much better and connect directly to the green line, plus everything that's going on there at that whole SDSC West area. Cool. Um, and then Cecily, people are wondering if um, there are any considerations for future um, extensions or, or other rail um, beyond like what we showed today um, on the map for the purple line, they mentioned like east-west connections on university or an extension to Mira Mesa potentially. Uh, that's a great question. And I think it gets a little bit into just what is the overall planning process that um, that we follow here at Sandag. We we work on the regional plan. We've mentioned that a couple of times in terms of, hey, what is the vision for the entire transit network in the region? And that's where we would identify those kinds of connections. Um, for now, I, as I mentioned, the purple line, as we've shown it on the map, is 31 miles. That's extremely long, uh, much longer than those example projects we found. So what's likely is we'll have to take that in chunks and as we're taking a project like that in chunks, there's certainly lots of considerations for what uh, future could look like uh, as we get more information, as things in the region change, uh, maybe we'll come up with different ideas about how future extensions, what future extensions could be. Um, but it's a little bit of planning at the project level, a little bit of planning at the system level to answer things like that. But um, certainly something we, we want to keep in mind where there's opportunities and a need for something like that. Yeah, and we'll definitely, we'll keep analyzing the data because um, our data team is looking at, you know, patterns of how people are moving. And if there's like development in a certain area, like a ton of people are moving on a certain route, then that can always like update our regional plan and, and the routes that we're considering. Yeah. Um, Brian, some folks were wondering um, about any transit that's being planned to connect people to the beach. So there are uh, also a couple of routes that would get you over to the beach. Uh, I mean, today, MTS just opened the rapid um, 227 from Otay Mesa and um, Iris area over to Imperial Beach. But we are we do have a route that um, is planned. Um, it's like a, a extension of the current local MTS bus route 10. And it would be similarly along University Avenue, get you down towards Old Town and then over to Ocean Beach. And then there are a couple of rapid routes that would get you from the Kearney Mesa, Claremont Mesa area um, over to Pacific Beach um, and then also up into La Jolla. Great. Um, and Cecily, somebody had a question. Um, how will the, if the purple line ends up being like a purple line to a certain location and then a transfer to the coaster, how will that be handled? Uh, yeah, I think there are a few different places. Um, I mean, today the coaster serves Sereno Valley Station, and there's uh, connections from the UTC area to that station, similarly connections from that station to the job centers out in Sereno Mesa. Uh, and so we're considering what, if we bring the purple line in, you know, first let's figure out where those stops should be. And one of the, one of the, key elements of where those stops should be are those connections um, to existing service. So it's it's really early. Um, it could look like something that's existing today where we have buses, local buses and rapid buses serving um, between University and Serena Mesa and some of those connect to the coaster station as well. Um, but it's going to be many years until the purple line comes about. So maybe there's something else that uh, that we could plan for. Maybe there will be changes to the coaster uh, in the meantime that we can plan around and make sure that these two rail lines are connecting as, as well as they can. 
Yeah, but obviously like major decisions um, will be dependent on like public input and as well. So we'll, we'll absolutely. be- Absolutely, absolutely. When we, yeah, when we're identifying where those station locations are, we'll come back to the public and and see like today, like, hey, what have we missed? Uh, what's What are some key considerations? And we're working a lot with our partners, city of San Diego and our transit operators, making sure that the project we come up with will work for everyone. Great. And Cecily, uh, someone asked, uh, will the purple line follow the 805 or is it going to use the blue line track? So right now on the map, we're um, assuming it would not use the blue line track because we don't know whether it would be a trolley that could use the blue line track or whether it would be, you know, some train that could use that. We really are hoping to serve more inland um, as, as Brian was sort of speaking to, to serve those north-south trips that currently don't have a, a really robust transit option. Um, but there's still more planning to figure out exactly where the route will go, exactly what that will look like. Um, but I think it's uh, pretty safe to say that for the majority, it won't be following the blue line. If we have the blue line running already. Yeah, and, and whether it's like an in-neighborhood situation where it's like elevated or above ground, the community is going to have to weigh in on that. Somebody also asked if um, the purple line will be electrified with an overhead wire. I think it depends on what type of transit it ends up being, and that's going to depend on input from you guys, but then also like how much funding is available for like the different types of projects. Um, and that'll um, be dependent on like the results of this coming election um, and a number of other factors. Yeah. Um, yeah, and if I could add to that, I've seen some questions about whether the purple line would be automated. Similar to some of these other questions, we we still have to decide what that transit mode would be, what what type of transit it would be. It could be an automated train. We certainly want to consider that as we've seen some of these come online across the country and, and in other countries. And um, first, what we'll really want to do is define really clearly what we need this transit route to do do we need it to be really really fast or do we need it to run as as long throughout the day as possible um, there's a lot of different sort of aspects that transit can serve and we need to work with the community to understand what the needs are and then we can decide what the technology is so that's all still to come we haven't asked those questions today because we're not there yet but um, just a little sneak peek at what we'll probably be coming back with next year. Great. Um, Brian, somebody was, oh, okay. I think somebody mentioned CBX. Um, are there any transit route connections to the Brownfield airport? Ooh, I don't think so. The, there's a proposed arterial rapid on roads out of Otay Mesa to Iris Transit Center that gets near the corner of Brownfield, but it's more, uh, um, it looks like Heritage and Otay Mesa Road is the closest it gets to at that. Got it. Any, like, I wonder if, is that in any, like, microtransit service areas? I'm pulling that up as well. I don't yeah. believe so. Okay. Okay, well, good to know. Um, what else are people asking? Um, oh. So one person asked, will the rapid bus 688 continue running once the purple line is completed? The answer is yes, right, Cecily? Yeah, it, uh, we, I think our focus is to get the 688 running so that we can connect these communities that we've gone through today. Um, there's certainly reason that the 688 could continue running once the purple line is is in service. I think when we get closer, we can evaluate that. Um, I'm thinking about when the Midcoast extension of Blue Line opened, and and there were current transit, you know, bus routes that had been running similar, at least like portions of it, and maybe they stayed running, but they changed their routing a little bit. Um, so something like that could happen, um, or maybe there's a good reason that the bus could keep running with the exact same route, and it would serve slightly different you know, destinations, slightly different types of trips. So uh, we'll, we'll have to evaluate that when we get closer to opening something like a purple line, but um, still there's no reason that they couldn't both run. 
people just want to make sure that that makes sense. Yeah. And it'll depend on like the riders and like the data of how people are moving during those times. And um, we'll, we'll probably cross that bridge when we get there. Um, Brian, someone asked, could the Rapid 688 extend to the Sorrento Valley Coaster Station and provide a single transfer connection from North County until the UTC Coaster Station is built? Yeah, that's something we'd look at. Because um, right now the coaster, you know, it's, it has, we have plans in 15, 20 years to also tunnel um, into UTC and, and provide a connection right there. But in the interim, um, would we want to get that down there um, at the Cerna Valley Station or, or not is something we'll look at as we continue this planning work. Okay. And Brian, um, someone was wondering if um, you have any ideas on travel times for different segments of the Rapid 688. Um, and they said they know you can't be super precise right now, but any any ideas or is it hard to tell? Yeah, no, that's really hard to tell. I mean, the local buses average speed is 10 to 14 miles an hour after, you know, stopping at, at all the stops. Rapid Expresses, like the 28290, actually get average travel times or speeds upwards of 40, 50 miles an hour um, because it, it only has to do a few stops downtown and a few stops up in Poway and Escondido. So, you know, when you're running along freeways and if we can get priority along the freeways to have it go as fast or faster than regular traffic, um, we'll be hitting travel times that are equal to those driving solo in the car. And that's the, that's our goal is to approximate or, you know, equal people's travel times in cars. Yeah, and all that's dependent on like how fast like some express lanes get built, things like that, that would allow for buses to get around traffic. Yeah, okay. Um, and Cecily, um, somebody's wondering about bathrooms and I'm eager to know that as well. What's going on with bathrooms at um, Purple Line stations? Do we know if there'll be bathrooms? Yeah, this is uh, maybe I'll, I'll, I put in the chat a little earlier, the. 2025 regional plan page, um, as we, you know, it keeps kind of being the theme today that we're still really early with purple line planning. But in, in terms of our vision for the transit network in the region, we recognize that bathrooms are really important. It's, it's just a basic need for people uh, getting through their day. So we have included in the regional plan that we expect new uh, major transit, like, like a rail project like this to have bathrooms. Um, we don't necessarily know, we don't even know where the stations will be located, but, uh, and if all of them will have bathrooms, but it's something that we know is important and, and uh, we're um, assuming that when we're thinking about project costing and planning for our regional transportation network that we, that we need to provide restrooms. Uh, and we're, I'll add to that, that we're also hoping to provide restrooms at even the existing rail that doesn't currently because just, uh, you know, it'd be great if Purple Line had bathrooms at every station, but what about folks on, uh, you know, uh, using a route now that doesn't have bathrooms at stations? We want to get restrooms there too. So that's in the regional plan, and we'll certainly keep it in mind as we continue planning for the Purple Line. Great. Um, um, and we had a question that, um, are we analyzing how um, less people might want to ride um, if they have to make transfers between different transit lines as we're analyzing um, what, what we're doing with the purple line. I don't know if- um... and, and yeah, just with any transit planning we're doing, we're trying to minimize the amount of transfers that people do because we realize that transferring is not as fun and it slows down your whole trip time. So as many what, what we call them one seat rides as we can provide. <laughs> is is ideal and um that's what we're looking to to do and that's why i you know i talked about the the duplication with the 235 265 i mean we, we could possibly combine these routes into one but then you make people have to transfer so anytime we can um minimize that we're, we're always looking to do that great and we've just got um a few more questions here. I think we, we'd had the call open until 7.15, so I think we can still um, keep plugging away. Um, somebody asked how long it'll take 
uh, for these two projects. We said the rapid 688 bus, we said as soon as maybe like six years, eight years, Brian, is that correct? Um, yeah, I'm nodding my head away. Yeah, but yeah, that's depending on how, um, how much um, infrastructure things we need to add or build. Um, if we can quick build something, um, but yeah, probably six, eight years. And the purple line, question marks, 20 years? At least 20 years, yeah. And it really will depend on what we land on for that. What is that type of transit that the purple line will be and uh, and what it what all the implications are. You know, tunneling is going to take a, a lot longer, um, but maybe that'll be worth it for all the benefits that come along with tunneling. It's still still to be determined, but I think looking at those Example, rail projects, they were all at least 20 years and a lot, lot shorter segments. Um, so that's that's what we can say for now. And well, I think we'll know a lot more once we decide on that particular transit mode. Great. And Brian, um, how often do we think the purple line would be coming? So, I, you know, I saw there was questions about the rapids as well. So most rapids um, we're planning at 10 minutes. On every average, time. during the peaks, every ten minutes, um, and I think the purple line right now, the regional plan is is kind of proposed at that. But again, we'll look at the actual demand modeling and all that to see what if it warrants more or less, or or what is needed. But ten minutes is our is our goal for for most routes, including locals that are in um, in areas that are more dense. Okay, and the purple line as well, every ten minutes probably. Yeah, I think purple line will be every 10 minutes. And when you're thinking about uh, something that could be a rail project, you know, you wouldn't necessarily want to design such that 10 minutes is the best you can do. If that's if that's what you're planning on, you, know, you might want to design for a bit more. And then if we end up getting some strong ridership, we could go towards a bit more. We just, we have to do that analysis to weigh, you know, how much would that cost? Um, is it, does it really give us the benefit that would make the cost worth it? or not, lots of analysis still, but um, just to share some considerations we make on the planning side. Thank you for that. And Brian, um, what's up with making the buses electric, um, especially the rapid routes? Um, what's the plan for that? Is there, like, I, I'm noticing there's some routes that are going electric. How is that decision made? So there's, a, there's a state mandate to electrify all the vehicles um, by 2032, 2035. So oh, MTS yeah. and NCTD are both on on task to, to do their best to do that. It's not as easy as it sounds. They, they need to add yards and they're working to do that as well, that where they can charge the buses at night. Um, but likely any new rapid route that we build that's not within the next five years, you know, if it's in something like this, if we're saying six to eight years, it would most likely be on electric buses. Um, now, I don't know if anyone's actually asking electrifying in terms of like what you see in San Francisco, with the overhead wires like we have on the trolleys, that's not currently in, in MTS or NCTD's plans on doing something like that. But electric buses are definitely, or you know, zero emission vehicles is what they're calling. NCTD is actually um, piloting hydrogen and things like that. But MTS is pretty built, locked into um, electric battery. Okay, and um, Cecily, someone's wondering, is it possible to add more purple line stations in denser areas like National City? Yeah, we'll certainly want to take the input we received today, what we get from the surveys to think about where those station locations could be. I will say that when it comes to a, a travel time, you know, how long does it take to get from uh, San Isidro to Surrend to Mesa? Um, some of that depends on the technology, like what kind of vehicle, what kind of transit vehicle do you have? But a lot of it is the number of stations, just it, um, every time there's a station, the train has to slow down and stop, let people on and off, accelerate again to get up to the max maximum operating speeds. So it's something that we'll need to look at, but I just wanted to kind of point out that it's, it's one of those trade-offs that we'll have to evaluate and work with the community to help decide, you know, do we want five stations, knowing that it'll be this much slower, or do we want to pare it down to be able to make it a little bit faster? That's something we'll wanna work with the community on. Yeah, thank you. And Brian, um, are we 
currently working on um, like making it easier to develop around transit stops so that more people want to ride transit? No, 100%. That um, MTS and NCD have both done a, gone a long ways to um, allow for that at, at existing stations and then at planned stations. And that's the way of the, you know, the future transit oriented development, really trying to densify around that area because it, it just helps each other in terms of um, success. Awesome. Yeah, um, and if I can add on to that, I saw a question about, you know, planning around future redevelopment to increase ridership. We definitely want to take into account the projections of how many people, how many jobs, where will they be in the region and use that information to do planning for particularly projects like the Purple Line that we know will take a long time to implement. And so in addition to working with the like MTS and NCTB that Brian mentioned, we also work closely with the cities where the, these routes will be to understand how they see their cities changing, their communities changing, um, making sure that when we're deciding on station locations, it takes into account not just what's there today, but what will be there in the future. And we do uh, some detailed like modeling of how many riders we think there will be if the if you know Kearney Mesa is redeveloped in such and such way. We can do testing like that. Great, um, Brian. Someone's wondering how much infrastructure would we have to add to get the Rapid 688 bus up and running? Yeah, and I saw another question about, um, you know, would we be using um, HOV lanes on the 805, things like that. So there are existing carpool HOV, lanes. sorry? Carpool lanes? Carpool lanes, sorry, yeah, HOV, I'm using nerdy <laughs> terms. Yeah. Um, that's carpool type lanes, uh, something like you have on the I-15 today, the, the toll lanes, but allow carpoolers in and transit buses in, and the idea is to get transit vehicles um, not having to slow down. And so um, 805 south of Palomar today, there are no HOV lanes. So we would like to do get those built into there. Um, I-15 um, south of where they end today at the 163, you know, we'd like to get some something in there to help speed up transit. And then when they actually hit the streets in the local areas like up in UTC or down um, at, at the border on our, the roads, we would like to provide something on that. So whether it's bus only lanes or um, signal priority at the intersections, things like that, those do start adding up and, and take capital um, investment and, and actually time to build and plan and engineer and clear through environmental. So those are the types of things that, that make the planning process and the actual time to um, open to the public a little bit longer. And signal priorities, fancy term for uh, like the bus comes and uh, the stoplight knows and it turns green. Correct. Yeah, which is a possibility, but it just depends on what the public wants for sure. And funding. Yeah. Um, great. And last question I had, I think, and we, we may uh, want to answer some of these via email because I think we'd said we'd go till 715 and I just had like um, some stuff I wanted to throw up on some slides uh, to stay in contact with us and help spread the word um, about this survey related to this topic. Um, so uh, somebody was wondering, Cecily, how do we um, take into account whether we're um, going to build the purple line as something that's tunneled or something that's elevated? Like, how do we weigh the, the costs and the benefits? How are those decisions made? Yeah, so we'll start by doing some evaluation of what's possible. What, what would it look like to be underground? What would it look like to be above ground? Um, working closely with you know, staff that work at the cities uh, uh, that would be affected by it. And then we'll definitely go to the community with what we found of like, hey, this is what it would mean to be underground. This is what it would mean to be above ground. Um, while I mentioned underground would be a, take a lot longer, it would be more expensive. But uh, some of the trade-offs of if you were to go above ground, yeah, you'd save some money, but now there's maybe more issues of privacy. You know, what are the buildings that you're passing near? Are you like looking into people's yards? Is that uh, just a non-starter for communities? Um, maybe there's issues with like noise. If you're underground, you're not gonna hear the train. So um, that's, that's a great benefit. Um, so there's a lot of, Kind of trade-offs to understand and we'll want to come back to the public once we have a better idea of those options 
and and get their input, help us make that decision um, because we you know that the community can can let us know what they need, what what will work best for them, and more more to come. Yeah, definitely. So this is um, just the the kickoff of this conversation. Um, and um, we really um, want to thank you guys for these questions. If we hadn't answered your questions verbally, um, we are going to go ahead and um, prepare responses to those. Um, and we'll email that out um, soon here, um, as soon as the project team uh, gets some time to answer those uh, thoroughly. Um, I know sometimes it like takes a little bit and it's because um, a lot of our planners are working on multiple projects all at one time. Um, so we thank you for your patience on that. Um, just wanted to let you go, uh, let you know that the survey um, that has the same questions you were polled on today where um, folks can drop in destinations that are popular um, is open until October 9th. Um, and you can let your community know about that by um, sharing um, any social media posts from Sandag that you see on that topic. Um, we're dropping a link in the chat to that survey if you want to send that out. Um, or if you um, are looking for some blurbs to drop in uh, an email blast, if you have um, lists of community members that you'd like to send that survey to, um, you can let us know um, at purpleline at sandag.org. We can send you graphics um, and blurbs uh, to go ahead and share that. So just wanted to let you know that. And um, we hope that you guys um, will stay in touch with us. Um, definitely the best way to hear about um, opportunities, give your feedback. Um, we're posting all of it on social media. Um, follow us at, at Sandag Region, um, Instagram and Facebook, or at Sandag on um, the artist formerly known as Twitter X. Um, or um, you can email us at purpleline at sandag.org. I know a lot of you had a lot of questions. If you're like, oh, I forgot to ask this, please feel free to email us and we'll get back to you. Um, and we really thank you guys um, again for taking time out of your day to learn about these projects. Um, and yeah, with that, I think we'll go ahead and end the meeting. Thanks everybody.